Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Friday, August the 14th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him, because we trust in his holy name. Our New Testament reading tonight is from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned, and if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let them marry, it is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart, to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then, he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, the very short Article 3 on Christ, and then the first part of possibly 8, now uh, see how we divide it up, uh, first part of Article 4 on Justification, which is again the longest article in the Apology. Article 3, Christ. Editor's Note. It was very important for the Lutherans to affirm the historic biblical confession of the Church, Christ is fully God and fully man. In his confession concerning Christ's Supper of 1528, Luther wrote, 
Here you must take your stand and say that wherever Christ is according to his divinity, he is there as a natural divine person, and he is also naturally and personally there, as his conception in his, mother womb, his mother's womb proves conclusively. For if he was the Son of God, he had to be in his mother womb naturally and personally and become man. He is not two separate persons, but a single person. Wherever this person is, it is the single indivisible person, and if you can say, here is God, then you must also say, Christ the man is present too. The article on justification is rooted in this article on Christ. Article 3, Christ. The adversaries approve Article 3, in which we confess that there are two natures in Christ. The human nature was assumed by the word into the unity of his person, John 1.14. Christ suffered and died to reconcile the Father to us and was raised again to reign, to justify, and to sanctify believers according to the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Article 4, Justification. Editor's Note. Article 4 of the Apology is the most complex article in the entire Book of Concord, because it deals with our salvation, that is, how God has forgiven our sins and has reconciled us to himself in Christ, it is also the most important. This article is the very heart of the Gospel and the most important teaching in the Holy Scriptures, Therefore, the Apology goes into great detail about the doctrine of justification. All Scripture leads us to, from, and back to the truth of Christ's work of atonement. God applies Christ's work to individuals freely by grace, through faith, without works. The article on Christ, the one we just read a minute ago, proclaims how God atones for sins. The article on the Church's ministry of the means of grace, Article 5, confesses how God applies to individuals the merits won by Christ. What brings these two articles together is the article on justification, which describes how we are justified, that is, declared righteous by God. Article 4, Justification. In Articles 4, 5, 6, and 20, they, the adversaries, condemn us for teaching that people obtain forgiveness of sins not because of their own merits, but freely for Christ's sake through faith in Christ. They condemn us both for denying that people obtain forgiveness of sins because of their own merits and for affirming that through faith, people obtain forgiveness of sins and are justified through faith in Christ. But in this controversy, the chief topic of Christian doctrine is treated. When it is understood correctly, it illumines and amplifies Christ's honor, which is especially useful for the clear, correct understanding of the entire Holy Scriptures, and alone shows the way to the un excuse me the unspeakable treasure and right knowledge of Christ, and alone opens the door to the entire Bible. It brings necessary and most abundant consolation to devout consciences. Therefore, we ask his imperial majesty to hear us with patience in matters of such importance. For the adversaries do not understand what the forgiveness of sins or faith or grace or righteousness is. Therefore, they sadly corrupt this topic, hide Christ's glory and benefits, and rob devout consciences of the consolation offered in Christ. In order that we may strengthen the position of our confession and also remove the charges that the adversaries advance against us, certain points are to be set forth in the beginning. Then the sources of both kinds of doctrine, that of our adversaries and our own, may be known. All scripture ought to be distributed into these two principal topics, the law and the promises. For in some places, Scripture presents the law, and in others, the promises about Christ. In other words, in the Old Testament, Scripture promises that Christ will come, and it offers for his sake the forgiveness of sins, justification, and life eternal. Or in the Gospel, in the New Testament, Christ himself, since he has appeared, promises the forgiveness of sins, justification, and life eternal. Furthermore, in this discussion, by law, we mean the Ten Commandments, wherever they are read in the Scriptures. We say nothing at present about the ceremonies and judicial laws of Moses. Of these two parts of Scripture, the adversaries choose the law because in some way human reason naturally understands the law, for it has the same judgment divinely written in the mind. By the law they seek the forgiveness of sins and justification. The Ten Commandments require outward civil works, which reason can in some way produce, but they also require other things placed far above reason. Truly to fear God, truly to love God, truly to call upon God, truly to be convinced that God hears us, and to expect God's aid in death and in all afflictions. 
Finally, the law requires obedience to God in death and all afflictions, so that we may not run from these commandments or refuse them when God lays them upon us. Here the scholastics have followed the philosophers. They teach only a righteousness of reason, that is, they teach civil works. Besides that, they imagine reason can love God above all things without the Holy Spirit, for as long as the human mind is at ease and does not feel God's wrath or judgment, it can imagine that it wants to love God, that it wants to do good for God's sake. In this way, they teach that people merit forgiveness of sins by doing what is in them, namely, when reason produces an act of love toward God, by grieving over sin, or when reason is active in doing what is good for God's sake. Because this notion naturally flatters people, it has brought forth and multiplied in the Church many services, monastic vows, and abuses of the Mass. In the course of time, with this opinion, someone has come up with one act of worship and observances, and someone else others. To nourish and increase confidence in such works, the scholastics have asserted that God must give grace to a person who does such works, not that he is forced to, but that God will not change what he ordered. In this opinion, there are many great and deadly errors, which would be too boring to list. Let the careful reader think only about this. If this is Christian righteousness, what difference is there between philosophy and Christ's teaching? If we merit forgiveness of sins by these acts, of what benefit is Christ? If we can be justified by reason and the works of reason, what need is there of Christ or of regeneration? See 1 Peter 1, 18-21. From these opinions, the matter has now reached the point that many ridicule us because we teach that a righteousness different from philosophic righteousness must be sought. We have heard that some preachers, after setting aside the gospel, have explained Aristotle's ethics instead of a sermon. Not that such men err if those things the adversaries defend are true, for Aristotle wrote about civil morals in such a learned way that nothing further about the topic needs to be demanded. We see books published in which certain sayings of Christ are compared with the sayings of Socrates, Zeno, and others. It's as though Christ had come to deliver certain laws through which we might merit forgiveness of sins, as though we did not receive this freely because of his merits. Therefore, if we here accept the teaching of the adversaries that by the works of reason we merit forgiveness of sins and justification, there will be no difference between righteousness of philosophers, or certainly of Pharisees, and of Christians. Yet the adversaries do not pass by Christ completely. They require a knowledge of the history about Christ, they credit him by writing that from his merit a way of life is given to us, or as they say, first grace, prima gratia. They understand that this is a habit, inclining us to love God more readily. Yet what they credit to this habit is of little importance, for they imagine that the human will's acts are the same before and after this habit. They imagine that the will can love God, but nevertheless, this habit stimulates it to love more cheerfully. They tell us, first, merit this habit by your earlier merits. Then they tell us we should merit an increase of this habit in life eternal by the works of the law. In this way, they bury Christ, so that people may not benefit from him as a mediator, and believe that they freely receive forgiveness of sins and reconciliation for his sake. They let people dream that by their own fulfillment of the law, they merit forgiveness of sins, that by their own fulfillment of the law, they are counted righteous before God. However, the law is never satisfied, since reason does nothing except certain civil works. In the meantime, a person neither fears God nor truly believes that God cares. Although they speak about this habit, God's love cannot exist in a person without the righteousness of faith, nor can his love be understood. And it goes on from there quite a bit, so you have to, and that's where we'll stop for the night, because that's, that's enough. Uh, and we'll try to break it into sections like that. And if you've never heard this article on justification before, uh, not because you like the sound of my voice, but I encourage you to either get a copy or read it online for free at bookofconcord.org uh, or listen to it again a couple of times because sometimes when we're giving our views of the adversary's position, it can sound like we're arguing for it when we're actually just laying it out, going, this is what they say, and then we come in and go, and this is why it's wrong. So you could be listening for five, ten minutes about the adversary's position, and you'll go, um, 
Is this what we believe or is this what they believe? It can be a little confusing because uh, these are these are hard. This is a hard document to uh, to read, uh, which is again why we have to read it or should read it more often than we do. So we'll go this way piecemeal, night by night, and uh, we'll work through it. And then maybe we will consider doing a full Bible study on the uh, Augsburg Confession and the Apology. I see CPH has just published just the Augsburg Confession and the Apology with some historical documents of import to it uh, as a, a reasonably priced little book. So maybe we'll consider doing that if people are interested. Uh, so that's how we'll progress for about the next week, week and a half it'll take us to get through just the article on justification. And then it will lighten up, but as the uh, editor's note showed, everything either rises or falls on the doctrine of justification. Either you have that or your salvation is in jeopardy because you don't know if you are saved or not. So that's where we'll leave it for tonight. And we'll join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And as always on Fridays, our Friday prayer uh, walks us through Christ's passion. Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true man, we thank you that you have redeemed us poor and condemned creatures, not by any of our works, merit, or worthiness, but by your holy suffering, death, and shedding of blood. O Lord, your suffering was great, your torment was heavy. We cannot comprehend how many your stripes, how deep your wounds or the bitterness and painfulness of your death. How inexpressible is your love that reconciled us to your heavenly Father. In great fear of death, you sweat blood on the Mount of Olives, drops of blood that fell upon the earth. And there, abandoned by all your disciples, you willingly gave yourself into the hands of those who led you mercilessly, bound hard and cruel from one unjust judge to another. You were falsely accused and condemned, spit upon, scoffed at, and struck in the face with fists. For the sake of our misdeeds, you were hit, whipped, crowned with thorns, and treated wretchedly, like a worm and not a man. You were despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, so that even a heathen heart took pity and said, Behold the man. For the sake of our sin, you were counted a sinner and hung up between two evildoers as a curse. You were pierced in hands and feet with nails, and in your highest thirst you were given vinegar and gall to drink. Finally, in great pain, you gave up your spirit, so that you could pay our debt and we could be healed by your wounds. O Lord Jesus Christ, for this and all your other suffering and pain, we give you thanks and praise. We pray you, let your holy, bitter suffering and death not be lost on us, but grant that at all times this may be our comfort, and that we may boast in it, and that as we ponder it, all evil desire in us may be snuffed out and subdued, and all virtue may be implanted and increased, so that we, having died to sin, may live in righteousness, following the example you have left us walking in your footsteps, enduring evil with patience, and suffering injustice with a good conscience. Amen. O Lord, keep your church with your perpetual mercy, and because of our frailty we cannot but fall. Keep us ever by your help from all things hurtful, and lead us to all things profitable to our salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body, and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.